mein Leserfunk. Ach, so, uh, so I just, uh, uh, some people just uh, tell me that uh, uh, when you get to the query system and it seems the PUT didn't work, and if you change to another uh, SSH client, and it might work. Okay. So, uh, but the PUT are uh, secure, secure, secure shell shell client, secure shell client. Yeah, that is also uh, one. I mean, that that was the one that provided by the. Uh, the, the UITS a couple of years ago, and later they changed the PUT. I don't know the reason for that. Um, but it seems that for the query system that that older client is working. Both of them are free, by the way, so go to download. Okay, so let's come back to talk about the states of genetics of complex disease before we have the next generation sequencing technology. We only have this for a couple of years, and. And uh, so this is a his history of DNA sequencing. So you can see from the very beginning, it's the 1870s, okay? It's the discovery of DNA. I'm not going to go through this list. I'm not a historian on that. Um, but the point here is uh, the, we, we start to have the ability to sequence the DNA from 1950s. And, uh, and uh, initially, one person can sequence one nucleotide <laughs> a year. Right, and then becomes uh, uh, 15, and uh, up to here, 1970s, so where is the Sanger sequencing? Okay, you can see Sanger here is about 1,500 nucleotides uh, per year per person, okay? And the beginning of a human genome project, uh, which is 1990, our capacity is about 200,000 nucleotides per year per person, okay? Have to sequence a year to get those. And, and now, for the next generation sequencing technology, we have is uh, uh, 100, uh, is that billion? Yeah, uh, when I, there's so many, the, the number, if it's so many zeros, the only time we see that is our national depths right now. <laughs> so so uh, uh, you can count the numbers. But this is the capacity of what we have right now. And in our uh, core facility, uh, Center for Medical Genomics, you will see next time, um, is uh, I think the, the, the machine itself can generate about uh, um, 100 giga of data per, per uh, week and with one technician, and that is very impressive. All right, so evolution, uh, evol evolution of uh, gene, gene discovery over the past two decades. So initially, the people start to use uh, microsatellites. So remember that two to six base pair and repeat uh, elements as uh, the marker to study, to identify genes. And uh, of course, there's not too many microsatellites across the human genome, and uh, the resolution is uh, very, very poor. So you say uh, this region is somehow related to disease, and this is a, a pretty big chunk, okay? And so you really don't know which part of uh, uh, within this region uh, are related to that. And later, that people start to use the SNP information as a genetic marker rather than microsatellites. And uh, you can see that this is 6,000 uh, um, uh, SNP markers across the, the genome. And uh, the resolution is uh, still very poor. And then we got uh, to 100,000 uh, uh, SNPs and 1 million SNPs. So, so I think. Uh, before we have this next generation sequencing technology, and the most dense uh, SNP array is uh, uh, from both Illumina and, uh, and the FA matrix, uh, they are close to, to one to two million uh, SNP markers on these arrays. And uh, these are the, so as you can get really very refined resolution, and, uh, which is 0 0.006 centimorgan, okay? And with the technology developed, and uh, the analysis changed a little bit as well. So initially, that people do more linkage, family-based linkage analysis, and later uh, working on the more on the uh, genome-wide association studies. So you can either still using the family information or not using the family information. Okay, and this is uh, uh, another figure just uh, from the same deliver the same type of information. And you can see that for the SNPs, and there's different technologies listed here, and Pac-Man, and uh, got one to 10 SNPs, or you can, in one batch, or you can use SNP arrays to get to close to one million SNPs. 
and this part will be used for the candidate gene uh, follow-up with GWAS studies, and this part is uh, more on the genome-wide association studies. Okay, so technologies really kind of determine the way we look at the data and the way that we find the disease-related genes. And genome-wide association studies, this is something just uh, a very popular a couple of years ago and still right now. And uh, so what genome-wide association studies are commonly used to link genetic variations, mo mostly SNPs, with disease or traits, okay? If the genetic variations are more frequent in person with disease, the variation are said to be associated with the disease. Okay. It's very straightforward. So in this figure, so you can see that this is a SNP. There's a two SNPs here, okay? And I apologize for the color, although I didn't make it. It just uh, happens to be this way. And uh, you can see that there's a, a nucleotide here, and a, either ACGT, and there's a variation. And these two are the same. So for person number one, it's kind of a homozygous on the reference SNP. And these two become a variation. And you can see this person two is a heterozygous. And this person three is a, a, a homozygous alternative allele. So it's completely different from the reference genome. Okay, and these colors here are two different SNP markers. And those uh, red person are the ones are heterozygous variants and a homozygous variants, and those uh, brown people, they are kind of heterozygous, and the purple people are uh, homozygous for the, for, the uh, for the reference. So you can see that in the case group, meaning the people who have specific disease, or this is a control group. In the case group, there's a more variation happens, and then you can see this particular SNP may be related, associated to that particular disease. Okay, and uh, uh, the underlying hypothesis of a genome-wide association study is uh, common disease, common variants. Okay, so this is a very, very important, and the common variants represent in more than one to five percent of the population contribute to common disease. Okay, so you can see this. Uh, uh, figure, and uh, I encourage you to read this paper. This is a re review paper in Nature in 2009. And uh, by the way, it's also in the, in the on-course system. You can, you can take a look at that. So X figure here shows uh, the allele frequency. Okay, so you can see this is the log scale. This allele frequency is 0 0.001. This is 0 0.05, okay? And uh, up until here, this becomes a very common variance, and this is a very rare variance. Okay, and the Y here really corresponding to the effect size. Effect size meaning that there are some variants you may have it, not have it, but if some variants are very rare, are very rare, but if you have it, and you got into trouble. And those variants are really having big effect size. And uh, the the so currently the our capacity is really to identify the. The, the association for the, for the SNPs that locates in this area. So it can be very common, but not too much effect size, but, or it's a very, uh, very uh, large effect size, but kind of pretty rare, okay? And this part is very simple to figure out. So those are the, a few examples of a high effect common variants influencing common disease. And those are already been discovered, most likely, all right? So the GWAS really focused on by this part. And our sequencing can help us to push towards the mod to the rare variants part, okay? And the GWAS generally do not capture rare variants uh, because they are based on the arrays and uh, and the arrays are, by definition, that it has to be common variants to be put on the arrays. And the, the study design of uh, GWAS study is uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of single nucleotide SNPs are tested for association with disease in hundreds or thousands of persons. So you can see a lot of data to go through. I mean, to do this type of experiment is very expensive as well. So the general study design, although there's some more other types as well, but the general study design, most people will do still the case control studies, okay? So you got a group of people who have that disease or a group of people who doesn't have that disease. 
and then you genotype both of the, these two groups, and then you see which variant occurred more often in the disease population versus common population. So those kind of case control type of study. The second type of study is a cohort type of study, which means that study subjects are selected to be representative of base population and are followed prospectively for the development of uh, numerous conditions. So one example is uh, you, you measure the, the, the blood sugar level and, uh, and to see how the genetic effect can really change that. It's not really specific to certain disease, rather it's more phenotype specific. So those are really the, the, the design of cohort studies, okay? All right. Uh, there's uh, one review paper, also from the same person, and published in 2010, New England Journal of Medicine. And this is a very interesting paper that summarizes all the significant association reported through March 2010. Okay? And think about that, how much money we already put into the GWAS. Okay? And, uh, and these are a summary of all the results that has been published so far. It includes 800 SNPs included in 545 studies and uh, focusing on 150 disease and traits. So this is a very nice resource, very nice information here. However, think about that. It's kind of disappointing. And those are the only ones that we identified, given the dollar amount of peop uh, money that, that, that already put into the GWAS studies. Okay. And uh, there are many limitations of GWAS. All right, I have to present some limitations. Otherwise, why do I study next generation sequencing technology, right? So the major limitation is uh, the lack of uh, functional information. So disease traits associated SNPs are not necessarily the causal variants, okay? So the variants you really identified in these GWAS studies are the SNPs on the SNP chips. They are only the so-called tag SNPs, okay, that represents this is a genome, local genome, genome region, and uh, it's not necessarily, if you see the association, that doesn't mean that particular SNP is causing the disease. So they are not really causal variants. And the tag SNP in the LD region, LD is a linkage disequilibrium, so you can think of that uh, part of the DNA region that always uh, um, um, go away together, okay? So a tag SNP, so for example, this one tag is representing this entire region. This is another tag, this is another tag, right? And if you see that this particular tag is associated to certain disease, that really doesn't mean this uh, SNP is causing the, the disease. Rather, it's something in this region is causing the disease. It can be the real causal effect it can be somewhere here, okay? And the identification of causal, causative variants would require further studies, for example, resequencing this uh, entire region to identify which variants happen there and which one is potentially causing uh, the disease. Um, and the second uh, limitation of GWAS is uh, the statistical power issue is, uh, so statistical analysis uh, entails an enormous number of association tests resulting in high potentials for false positive results. So what that means is that when we say the GWAS study, you think of one million SNP arrays. There's one million markers will be identified. And uh, the, the most simple way to think of that, you have to calculate one million associations, right? And uh, for this SNP, whether it's, a cost, it's a related to disease, this one is related. So each one has a p-value. So after you do this multiple hypothesis correction, it's really hard to get really very, uh, so if you, you identify something, it has to be have very, very, very small p-values, like a 10 power minus eight or nine level of p-values. Sometimes uh, to, uh, to get to that level of significance, you really need a larger, much larger sample size, and we know this GWAS is not cheap. So it's, sometimes it can be hard. Very large sample size are needed to reduce false positives and improve the reproducibility results. But I'm not saying that the next generation sequencing can fix it. And likely it will make things worse because there's more variants will be identified 
the novel ones will be identified. So if you correct the, the multiple hypothesis testing, it's even in the worst shape. Okay, one of the potential solutions for this, uh, uh, for the GWAS study, is multi-stage design, including replication studies using independent samples, and to limit the number of uh, false positive results. So you can see that if uh, there's a three-stage study, if there's a uh, about five variants in in that, uh, uh, so basically they design some. Um, they, they did made some benchmark data. So they, they pretend this is something associated to disease. And then they were trying to see whether we, they can find them out. And there are uh, the first stage, so they can analyze 400 individuals. And, and this is the number of SNPs that they analyzed. And the power is not, very, it's not going to be very good. But they only focus on the significant regions. And then they further increase the size, but focus on much smaller number of SNPs, and then do a much larger uh, sample size on an even smaller stage. And that will help you to really get into the much higher uh, statistical powers. So this is uh, the paper if you're interested in, and just uh, goes to this uh, JAMA um, uh, publication. Okay? And uh, so we already talked about two limitations of GWAS. The first one is uh, the markers you identified are not really causal variations. And the second one is uh, the statistical issue. OK. And there's another very important paper, and actually the same paper we just mentioned. The, the, the title, I think, of the paper is called uh, Missing Heritability. OK. So the GWAS, this is also another GWAS limitation. So identify variants in GWAS typically account for only a small proportion of the heritability and disease risk. So you, I mean, we, you, you, even for some disease, you identify some genomic regions. But those regions are on, can only explain a, a small proportion of uh, the disease risk. But why that happened? Okay? And the median odds ratio per copy of risk allele for the published GWAS study is very, it's 1.33. Okay? And the, the potential source of missing heritability is why we haven't seen those heritability in the GWAS study. It's a SNPs with a prevalence less than 5%, because most of the GWAS study is a common variance, common disease. So you focus on those common variants. But a lot of diseases are related to the rare variants, so you don't really see them uh, in the uh, GWAS study. And low frequency. Uh, allele frequencies, and which from 0.5% to 5% are really rare variants, less than 0.5%. And those are not on the SNP array, so you're not going to see them. And the Southern Genome Project tells us there's more than 11 million novel SNPs in our human genome, which any one of them can contribute to the heritability of certain disease. And the second issue, the potential thing that uh, uh, of the missing heritability is uh, the interactions between genes or between genes and the environmental factors. So what, what that means is uh, when we do the GWAS study, so most people will look for the association between individual SNP marker with the disease phenotype, okay, and do it one by one. But there are certain cases like uh, uh, you need two things that happen together to cause the disease. And for those type of things, it's really, really hard. Because uh, you, you think about one million SNPs, uh, if you think about every two pair, possible two pairs, uh, that is a lot of a combination. How about three pairs, right? So those are the things that it's really not solvable uh, with the current uh, um, computational uh, structures. That's why the interactions between genes and between genes and environmental factors are contributing to those, and they are not missing in the GWAS studies. Another one is uh, contributions of structural variations, including the copy number variations, the inversion and translocations, and, and all these things. And the GWAS will miss it, but NGS, uh, next generation sequencing, can really help. OK. Any questions so far? Any GWAS guy wants, are not happy? No? <laughs> All right. Uh, actually, those are the things that, that I just read papers and I've never done GWAS in my life. So if Tatiana is mad next time when she comes here, and let her to explain things. <laughs> right. um, 
And uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the, the next generation sequencing enables breakthrough in genetics of complex disease. So keep in mind, I'm going to talk about two major applications, two types of major application. The first one is in the research market, meaning how this next generation sequencing can really help us to know, understand the mechanism of disease. So this is the ideology part, okay? And there's another chunk, which is personal genome sequencing. It's also sequenced the genome. And that is the second part of uh, this, uh, this topic. Uh, in this uh, ideology part, I'm going to talk about three examples. The first one is, uh, and all these three examples are published in Nature Genetics. And the reason I pick those are not that they are great, or they are in the Nature Genetics. That's part of the reason they are in, in the Nature Genetics. But they are really representing three ways of using this technology to, an identify, to understand the disease. The first one is a whole genome sequencing following GWAS. And this is uh, for the, a disease called SSS. I don't know what that is. Sick sinus um, uh, syndrome. OK. And the second uh, example is so the first one is the whole genome sequencing. The second example is the exome sequencing. So you only sequence the exome part. And uh, one uh, result they got is to uh, study the Miller syndrome. And the third one is a uh, pooled sequencing and to study human complex one disorder. Okay, so let's go to the first one, this uh, disease called SSS. This is uh, published in Nature Genetics in this year, okay? And this wide range of electrophysiology abnormalities, including failure in the sinus node, and uh, so pretty serious when you read it, right? although I don't know what that is, can happen at any age, but primarily a disease of elderly, and often secondary to the uh, cardiac disorders for the young individuals, younger individuals. And the treatment is a permanent cardiac pacing. Okay, so. All right, so they were trying to see what gene is causing this uh, disease, or contributing to this disease. And uh, the step one they did is uh, the GWAS study. Okay, they did a case control design, and the population is Atlantic population. It's a very restricted population. Okay, and they have the case group. They have almost 800 patients and 37,000 controls. So this is they really put a lot of money into this study. It seems, and they use the FE metric SNP arrays. I think or Illumin. I don't remember which one it is, but with one million or two million SNP markers on the array. And when they do the association study, they use the 7.2 million SNPs on the SNP arrays and based on the imputation, okay? Um, I hope Tatiana will talk about the imputation on, on next week. If, if he, she doesn't, I will talk about it a little bit, but I do need to learn it. So the point is, uh, for this uh, SNP arrays, uh, you only find out the tag SNPs, and then you can get a more higher resolution and by some uh, uh, computational approach. So for the SNP arrays, you got uh, 2 million um, uh, SNPs, and, uh, so inc and, and you do the imputation, and you got 7.2 million SNPs. And uh, they found the association between this disease and uh, and this particular SNP marker in the chromosome 14 region. That's the conclusion of their, uh, their GWAS study, which is uh, pretty nice, okay? And, uh, but the problem is uh, they find out this variant, this SNP, but it's tag SNP, it's not really causal, and, uh, and go for the region marked by, by this region. So how, how can we know that which in exact variation is causing this particular disease? or have stronger association. So their strategy is that they did whole genome sequencing on 87 individuals with average 10x coverage. So one genomic location they covered the twice. It's not very deep, right? Most of the uh, whole genome sequencing, we want to have about 30x coverage or beyond to be able to confidently call there's a variation there. But uh, that, this is uh, the experiment they did. So 87 individuals including 80 controls and, uh, and seven SS patients, and four of them carrying this uh, SNP they identified, and three of them doesn't have this mark. And uh, the results summary is they got, uh, after this whole genome sequencing, they got 11 million SNPs were called. 
That's a lot of SNPs, right? And there's no significant SNP out of 14.11Q region. And again, this is a region they initially identified by the GWAS study. Okay? So there's no significant SNPs outside of this region was, was observed. Okay? It's kind of wasted, right? So if they, I guess if they know it, they really don't have to do the whole genome sequencing. They can really just design the target array to capture this particular region and then do the further sequencing of it. Like they can be on more individuals. Okay? But this is what they did. But within this 14.11Q region, the strongest association happens here, okay, this particular uh, variant. And uh, it occurred in all four carrier individuals. All these four have it. And all the three non-carrier cases, all the three doesn't have it. And one carrier controls. One people that have this variant but is not having the disease also don't have it. So this is uh, the, the strongest association what they discovered. And this, is, uh, the, this particular uh, variant is uh, non-synonymous mutation in exon 18 of this uh, MALH6 gene. It's a gene coding uh, alpha heavy chain subunit of cardiomyosin. Okay? And also they found there's no other significant association after accounting for the effect of this particular variant. And it seems uh, this is a pretty good target uh, to do the further study. Okay? So just uh, think, uh, not really trying to study their results, but think of the way they are thinking. They did GWAS, identified a region, did whole genome sequencing on much smaller samples, and then identified a variation. Looks like uh, it's a, have much stronger association with the disease. It's not satisfying, not there yet. So what they do is they further did many studies to validate this rare variant. So they see this, uh, this variant showed a significant association in 87 samples, and, but are they representative? So the question here is, uh, this is a good association in this 87 samples. 87 is such a small sample. How about other people, right? There's uh, so many different peoples there. And what they did is they zoom in the region, which is axon 18 region, in many more individuals. And uh, in many individuals, including 351 Icelanders and the same population, some of with disease, others are controls. They further did summer sequencing on axon 18 of all these individuals. Okay? And also they did another SNP array on the same, same uh, individuals. So, so basically they want to test how good this, uh, this uh, uh, genotyping uh, platform works well. And then they further did uh, uh, this uh, SNP array and on another 500 individuals, so they didn't do summer sequencing, and, uh, which include uh, 50 patients and, uh, and 470 controls. So this is uh, the data they have at this stage. They have SNPs on chip, genotyped, and uh, this uh, together is uh, 900 individuals. Is my math correct? Doesn't seem so, but okay, this is considered as 900 individuals. And uh, some of these uh, SNPs on the chips, they were genotyped, and, uh, and this region is a part of also genotyped, okay? And then keep in mind that they have also this uh, uh, 37,000 individuals that were initially already genotyped. Okay, based on the chips. And then they further did the imputation in this local region and trying to see whether this, uh, uh, what is uh, the, the, the result for this uh, particular marker likely in, in this uh, uh, broader individuals. And then they, they look at association between these two, uh, whether this uh, case and control or this uh, SNP is uh, it's really something that's highly associated. And the results are great. They, this uh, particular allele, the allele, uh, the allele frequency is only 0.38%, okay? And they found the effect size of this particular one is 12, and it's really, really high. Uh, the odds ratio is really, really high. And more strikingly, and this is a very interesting figure, so you can see 
X here are the year of birth. So these are very old individuals. This comes to younger individuals, okay? And this is the percentage of people who carry this particular variance and eventually develop into this disease. For the very old people here, 1920s or even older, and uh, more than 50% of people who carry this variance that eventually develop into this SSS, this disease. And of course, with the younger population, they haven't showed up, they just need to wait, right? So, so this is a, one of the example to see that how people can publish a paper in Nature Genetics, how much work they really need to do. So what do we have learned from this study? Certainly, yes. This particular one, um, I don't know. I don't know. They didn't mention that. I haven't, I haven't checked that. I haven't think that. All right. So what we have learned from this study, certainly not which gene is important, which variant is important, but the way of their, do, their thinking. So combining SNP genotyping and whole genome sequencing can facilitate the discovery of disease associated to uncommon variants with substantial effects. So really remember that figure, okay? And it's really pushed to, towards the left end of the figure, which is the rare variance, large effect size. And using high throughput sequencing technology, this design extends the gene discovery beyond the common variance, common disease hypothesis, which is used by the GWAS. And genotype imputation can be a powerful tool to improving the statistical powers for association studies, okay? And this study did not further test whether the identified variant is mechanistic, so whether this is a causal variance, uh, we still don't know about it, but likely it is, okay? So any questions regarding this, uh, to this example? Just think us through the way they are doing experiment, yes? They did see, I mean, the, the tax snip were, were, were in the initial genotype of the population, and they, they uh, see the association, but not that strong. And then when they, when they look at, when they go back to this, uh, this figure, and when they further genotype, I mean, some, some of them are based on imputation, others are based on the, the real genotyping, and they see this is much, much higher effects. So they, they did went back to see the tax snips. I'm not sure they do have the, the family structures in this study. This is a typical GWAS study, not a really family-based study, for, at, at least for this particular example. Okay? So let's move on to the next uh, uh, example, which is the exome sequencing and uh, they study Miller syndrome. As you can see, it's amazing that how little resource they use to publish this. And the Miller syndrome, I guess they are just getting lucky, and this is uh, something that they can really identify from the Miller syn uh, from the exome sequencing. Uh, Miller syndrome is a Medellin disorder and rare multiple malfunction disorders. So there's something to learn from this uh, disease as well. And hypothesized to be an autosome recessive disease, but likely to be an autosome dominant disease. Okay, so what is uh, recessive, what is dominant? I want to just uh, briefly introduce it. And uh, if uh, this is the gene encoded for the color of the eye, okay, if this is a mother gene, it's blue, and father gene is brown, okay, and uh, likely, and the uh, eye brown, so this particular individual, the color of their eye is brown, okay. And uh, because the blue is a recessive, so you need both to be blue to have a, a blue color eye, okay? If one of them is brown, and uh, it, you will have a brown eye, and that is uh, the definition of dominant, okay? And uh, uh, why we do exome sequencing? That's another question. Why is, is that anything good with it, okay? And, but the reason, I think, one of the major reasons is whole genome sequencing is just still too expensive. We cannot afford that, so we have to do something likely to be more important. So positional cloning studies focus on protein coding sequences have 
when adequately powered, proved highly successful of identification of variants underlying mutagenic disease. And the clear majority of allele variants known to underlie Mendelian disorder disrupt protein coding sequences. Okay? That's the reason that they went ahead to do the axon sequencing, because they think uh, the variations on the axons are more likely to be important, although it's not necessarily true. Uh, and uh, splice acceptor and donor size, and those are the, the variants that would disrupt the splicing mechanism and represent additional class of sequence that are enriched for highly functional variants and are therefore targeted as well here as well. So the, for the, if, if the, when some variation really mess up with the splicing size, and that those will be sequenced in the axon sequencing part. So it's already included in the data. A large fraction of rare non synonymous variants in the human genome are predicted to be uh, deleterious, and this uh, contrast with non-coding sequences and uh, where variants are more likely to have neutral or weak effects on phenotypes even within well-conserved uh, non-coding uh, sequences. So the point is, again, the variations in the coding region are more likely to be phenotypically important. That's why when we have some limited resource and axon sequencing is still a good choice. Okay. And uh, the study design of this experiment is they only did four individuals, four individuals. So, uh, and with, from three families, A and B, they are siblings from the same family, and C and D, they are unrelated. That's all. That's all they did, okay? And uh, the experiment they did was a single end, 76 base pair rays, and uh, they generated, they focused on 26.6 megabase mappable targeted axon regions, okay? So those are the size of the human axon, although we know that uh, for the other platform that we focus on about five, 50 megabase uh, region, but this particular study is a 26.6 megabase region. And uh, they did a 40x coverage per individual, and that is uh, pretty standard, I think. And uh, they focus on non synonymous variants, and synonymous variants, and that is more disrupting the splicing, uh, acceptor and donor size, and the insertion deletion. So, so these three type of variants are the ones they focus on. And in A and B, which are the individuals in the same family, and they identify at least a single variant in 4600 genes and two or more variants in 2800 genes. Okay? So if you, th that, that's the reason they use the two individuals. If you, you only focus on one individual, you will see much more variants, but they want to see that in this family and that they, they have at least one single variant in 4800. 600 genes and two or more in 2,800 genes. And uh, that narrowed down the list of the genes a little bit, although not too much. Okay. So why this, uh, uh, the different models will lift, lift, uh, uh, lead into different results, okay? So we, we talk about this Mader syndrome that people think is a recessive disease, but it's likely to be dominant as well. So they want to see whether it's dominant or recessive, and one way to do it that it doesn't assume anything, right? So they initially, they focus on this is the dominant model, why it's important, okay? Why dominant model is important. So each sibling, A and B, or B, was required to have at least one new um, non-synomious or uh, splicing variants or insertion deletion variants in the same gene, okay? If this is a dominant disease, this is one individual and uh, two uh, chromosomes, right? If there's a variant, if this one gene goes bad, one variant causes this gene goes bad, and if this is a dominant disease, and this person is going to be sick. Does that make sense? So if it's a dominant disease. Rather, if it's a recessive disease, you need uh, both these two genes goes bad. So one variance happens in each other. It doesn't have to be the same one. It doesn't have to be the same variance. But both two genes goes bad, and this person is sick. Okay? So this is a very powerful um, 
filtering, if you think about this is a dominant disease or not a, a, a recessive disease, it's very, very different. And uh, uh, when Tatiana gives the talk, I'm sure that he will show you those kind of family paradigms and, uh, and which one has a disease, which one doesn't have it. And one of the major conclusions they got from those are whether this disease is likely to be dominant or recessive. And because the dominant one or recessive one, your way of analyzing the data will be different. Okay, I want to give you some prime on this now. And when Tatiana gives talk, I hope that you can get into a little bit further. Any questions here? Okay, all right. Variants were detected in the same genes among A, B, C, or D. It doesn't have to be the same variants. Under dominant model, one variant per individual. Remember that? Not a two variant. One variant per individual. And they have eight genes left. Eight genes happens in all the six, uh, four individuals. Okay? And under recessive model, they have only one gene left, which is this particular gene. Okay, I'm not trying to read it. Okay, presumably important. All right, and uh, the conclusion for this part, I didn't read very thoroughly, but uh, they, they said the recessive model was favored over dominant model for Miller syndrome based on the observation that each case was a, a compound heterozygote for new this mutation and five or six mutations were predicted to be damaging in this particular gene, okay? So again, this is uh, something I think they really, they, I mean, first of all, this is a very good experiment, right? They did the axon sequencing. This is a very rare disease and they identified its variants. And I think this is the first time they bring in this dominant recessive model helping us to understand which variant is potentially uh, causing the disease. But sometimes it's not that easy. And when Tatiana gives talk, and uh, we know it's kind of pretty painful as well. For this one, they did a good job, but at the same time, they got lucky. All right. The third application, okay, are we okay now? So the first application was whole genome sequencing follow GWAS. The second one is axon sequencing. And the third one, I'm going to talk about the pooled sequencing when people are poor like us. We don't have money, too much money, so we have to do the pooled sequencing, okay? So for this project, it's also published in Nature Genetics. I keep messing up this. I don't remember. It's 2010 and 11. But anyways, they publish it. So this disease is a mitochondrial respiratory chain disease, and there's actually many different forms, and uh, complex one deficiency, one in... 5,000 live births represented in infancy and very early adulthood. And it can be a Lyme syndrome, and uh, I mean, it can be many different types of things. It's pretty serious. It seems a nasty disease, right? And many genes are involved, the mitochondrial, both mitochondrial and nuclear genes. Many genes are involved in this disease. The knowledge we have right now is uh, roughly 15 to 20% of isolated uh, 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 disease cases are due to the mutation in mitochondrial, rest are caused by uh, nuclear defects. Okay, this is the knowledge we have right now. And 25 genes has been identified by the candidate gene and sequencing and linkage analysis or uh, homozygosity mapping. So, which means this is a complicated disease. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, way can, you can go wrong. But the bottom line is uh, we do have some knowledge about this, okay? It's not going to be the whole genome sequencing. And we already know there's some important genes that are related to this disease. We want to further characterize it, okay? So that is, uh, so the general strategy here is uh, they had uh, 103 cases, okay? And uh, 100, focusing on 103 genes. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this because uh, all these things will be talked about in the later slides. Okay, so the pool they have for this uh, uh, sequencing is uh, they have 103 cases and 42 controls. And uh, they do, I mean, they put uh, tw 20 to 21 individuals in one pool of DNA sequence. And they have five pools of uh, cases and two pools of controls. All the controls are actually coming from the haplomap samples. Okay? And uh, they, 
they did a PCR amplification on 103 genes. I mean, it happens to be 103 as well, so don't worry about that. And these 103 genes actually have four, 653 axons. The overall region they did the target, they did the PCR target, is 145 KB region. It's not very long, okay? So for the pooled sequencing project, you better start from some biological knowledge. You already know this part is important, okay? Now I'm going to pull so many individuals, 20 samples into one pool, and then I need to run PCR to target, to grab the regions that I'm interested in. And uh, so the, the region that they did PCR is uh, 145 kilobase region, and uh, with uh, almost 1,000 PCR amplicons. Okay? Any questions on this? So they have the pools and they have the PCR product and, uh, and uh, pull down certain regions. And the platform they did sequencing is the Illumina sequencing and the coverage here is for 90% of nuclear targets, nuclear targets are not the mitochondrial ones, it's over 100x coverage, okay? Is that pretty big? Yeah, it's pretty deep in terms of 100. But think of you have 20 individuals put into one sample and the 100 coverage is not very deep, okay? And uh, the, but, but the median coverage is 3,400, the uh, X coverage, so 168 per individual. And that is a pretty deep coverage for most of the regions, okay? This is their um, kind of their coverage. And the results here is uh, they detected 600 high confidence variants in the case pool and 264 low confidence variants supported by at least three reads on each strand. All right, just uh, again, think of their study design. They don't have money to sequence every individual. Rather, they pull 220 individual DNA into one pool, and then they use a PCR to target this specific region and the data sequencing. Oh, this one? Well, so, so basically they found that, that for the 90% of nuclear targets, okay, nuclear genes, okay, and uh, so some of the regions, they have deeper coverage, others they don't have too much deeper coverage, okay, and the median coverage is like a 50 percentile. We have 50% of the regions that the coverage is uh, higher than 3,400 uh, X, right? But uh, that's only for 50% of it. But 90% of them is uh, higher than 100X coverage. So that's a, it's just a 90 percentile or, or 50 percentile issue. No, it's useful for everything. I mean, even for the axon sequencing, and you will be able to, they, they, they do have the statistics on what is the average coverage, the median coverage, 90% of the coverage, what 90% of the regions, what the coverage is, or things like that. It's average. It's average. Yeah. Usually it is. So for the axon sequencing, we are more happy with uh, 80x coverage, at least. In many cases, we have that deep. Okay? And then, they, uh, before they want to make a story, they want to see the accuracy of the, the, the way they identify it. And uh, because they have uh, two map, have map controls and two pools, uh, we including 42 individuals, and they can consider that they already know the variants in these hypermap samples because those are already sequenced in many other places. So they found that with uh, larger than 100 reads coverage, 100x coverage, and the sensitivity for those uh, hypermap individuals are 92%, okay? Which means that 92% uh, of variants in this region, in the hypermap samples, they were able to identify it, okay? The specificity of this is 99%, okay? It's pretty good, uh, although we all know that this really doesn't mean much. 
given the large number of negative positions, right? Negative positions meaning the positions that it's not, there's no variance. So that's why that uh, sensitivity is an important measure here, but I don't like the specificity. For many of these studies, uh, if people publish on ROC curves, it really doesn't mean much because of the unbalance between the positive and negative numbers. And precision recall curve is a much better measurement for that. But we can get into that in the later lectures. For the rare variance, however, and the sensitivity is uh, 86% sensitivity for doubletons. Doubletons meaning two individuals have it, okay? And 66% for the singletons. So you can see that the, the more rare the, the variant is, the more difficult you will be able to identify it using this pool sequencing strategy. That makes sense, I mean, but the, the statistics are important. For the minor allele frequency estimated from read counts correlated with strongly with the expected frequency in hypermap pools, meaning that we got this uh, one pool, 20 individuals, we can estimate the minor allele frequency of, uh, of that particular variation. And for the hypermap samples, because the variation we already know, and we also know their real allele frequency, and the estimation, the correlation is very, very high. So that, that means uh, the sequencer, the general strategy uh, really worked. So this is a kind of a, a validation on their accuracy part because of the use of so many hypermap samples. And the variance prioritization is the next step, right? So you identify the 600 variants or 200 variants with low confidence. How, which one do we need to pick? Which one do we want to focus on, right? And uh, they want to throw out the variants that are not likely to be very useful. The first way to do that is uh, they, they throw out the variants in healthy individuals, okay? Healthy individual meaning hypermap samples. They already have those, uh, those samples. So because of hypermap individuals, they are not sick, okay? So if there's a variance happens both in this uh, case and uh, also happens in the, in the general populations, it's unlikely to be very uh, uh, important in this disease. And they also filter out uh, synonymous variations, meaning those variants that will not cause amino acid sequence changes. And uh, we just mentioned that it's okay to do it, and that's a common practice, but there are a lot of synonymous variations that are important as well, right? But uh, that's what the way they do it. They did it. They also filter out non-coding variants. <coughs> so meaning that uh, the variants are not in the protein coding genes. They throw those away. They assume those are not important. And uh, they also filter out the missense variants with low conservations. Okay? So for the ones that change amino acid sequences, but it's not really evolutionarily conserved, they think it's unlikely or less likely those have important biological consequences. So they filter out these individuals and then they still have 109 uh, variants that is uh, in this highly confident ones left and those are more likely, so remember initially we have 600 something, right? And they found 109 left in this group and 107 left in the second group, which is a, a lower uh, uh, confident uh, variance. And then, next step. This is very important in pool sequencing. I still want to uh, stress out the point that I'm not trying to ask you to understand how this gene works or things like that. I'm trying to ask you to think through the, the general study design they use. They put samples together amplify certain regions and did deep sequencing, identify the variants, filter out the unimportant ones, and so you got about 100 or 200 variants are likely to be important. Now, they come back to these individuals, and then they want to further genotype the rare variants. Okay, the variants, the 100 something variants they identified. They want to further genotype it in the disease and control samples. The reason they want to do that is uh, the first thing is uh, it's necessary to validate, all right? Some, you can always identify is that real, and you want to use other technology to prove that. More importantly, however, and for the pool sequencing, you will not know that 
you only know there's a variance there. You don't know which individual of this variance come from, from that pool of 20 individuals. You only know it happens in these 20 individuals. You wouldn't know which individual. So only after you do the further genotyping, it allows you to assign the variance back into the individuals. And then those kind of association type of studies will further be possible. The results here is uh, they validated 84% of high confidence variance and 11% of low cons uh, uh, confidence variance. Overall, they validated 151 likely del deleterious uh, variance and corresponding to 100 and 15 uh, unique low size. And these are our other general statistics. And uh, for the 60 individuals with this disease without a previous genetic diagnosis, they were able to assign it back to which gene went wrong. And they ha can help to conduct a genetic diagnosis. Okay. So uh, that, that slide, the previous slide, is not very important. But the summary here is the pooled sequencing identified variance in disease cohort and then further genotype on variants. Great approach using limited resources. You don't have too much money to spend. And that's why we, we, we have to do this uh, uh, pooled sequencing and only target on small part of the genome. Either save dollar or use the funds to genotype more individuals. So that can increase your stat, stat, uh, statistical power. But pooled sequencing is not really perfect. There's a lot of problems associated with that. The first one is, uh, what if uh, the causal variance in, resides in uh, non-targeted genes? So you have to target on this 140-something KB region. What if the variance uh, happens on other regions? So it really relies on a lot of your previous uh, biological knowledge. And, uh, and it can also on the non-target regions, um, but such as regulatory regions of an annotated axon, it was not detected. Be it can cause were not detected because of the lack of sensitivity, because you, you're pulling 20 samples into one pool. So it's much harder for the sequencers to figure out whether there's a variance or not. So the sensitivity can drop, for the, especially for the mitochondrial DNA for this, their purpose. And they can, if the variance contains a full axon or, or gene deletions okay, in one of the pools, if in one pool there's five people that have one gene deleted or one axon deleted, and which this approach you cannot really identify those. And uh, we're presented in the discovery screen, but filter out by the stringent criteria is possible as well. So those are potentially cause the false negatives. So, so these are something that really keep in mind. Again, uh, for the next generation sequencing and disease discovery, so I talk about three examples. And there are really three types of experimental designs. The whole the genome sequencing follow the GWAS, the axon sequencing, and pooled sequencing. They were all managed published in, in Nature Genetics, and they were really having Help us to, to identify, help us identify the, the, the causal uh, effects or some of the uh, associations. So we will have take another five minutes break and uh, we'll come back in five ten. That's about ten. <laughs>